on World News Tonight. Stronghold attacked. Russia's military onslaught has taken no prisoners as lethal attacks leave many dead. The latest act of violence targeting a military base near the Polish border, causing even displaced citizens to fear for their lives. Taking cover. Residents in Kyiv are holding on for dear life as Russian forces increase the frequency of attacks against the now vulnerable city, shelling causing the loss of innocent lives. Meanwhile, high stakes talks ensure between the two parties. Surging cases. Countries around the world are once again witnessing the rapid spread of COVID, causing skyrocketing hospitalizations and deaths, and governments scale back what little freedom citizens have left. And call of love. Paralympians bid adieu to the grand stage with spectacular performances that amaze the masses. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Our top stories this week as well still begins with the updates on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. A month ago, Chinese leader Xi Jinping declared there was no limit to Beijing's newly strengthened relationship with Russia. With that said, the United States warns against China if they continue to help in Moscow. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan warned Beijing that they would absolutely face consequences if it helped Moscow evade sweeping sanctions over the war in Ukraine. Sullivan's comments come as he is due to meet with China's top diplomat, Yang Jiechi, in Rome on Monday. In comments to CNN, Sullivan said that the United States believed China was aware that Russia was planning some action in Ukraine before the invasion took place, although Beijing may not have understood the full extent of what was planned. Now, according to Sullivan, Washington was watching closely to see to what extent Beijing provided economic or material support to Russia and would impose consequences if that occurred. He added, quote, we will not allow that to go forward and allow there to be a lifeline to Russia from these economic sanctions from any country anywhere in the world. Meanwhile, Russia said on Sunday that it was counting on China to help it withstand the blow to its economy from Western sanctions. Western countries have imposed unprecedented sanctions on Russia's corporate and financial system since it invaded Ukraine on February 24th in what it calls a special military operation. Russia and China have tightened cooperation in recent times, as both have come under strong Western pressure over human rights and a raft of other issues. Beijing has not condemned Russia's attack on Ukraine and does not call it an invasion, but it has urged a negotiated solution. Russian forces have carried out multiple airstrikes on a military training ground in western Ukraine, bringing the war closer to NATO's front line. However, despite the ongoing tensions, Russia and Ukraine has resumed conversation. Russian missiles hit a large Ukrainian base in Yavoriv near the border with NATO member Poland, killing 35 people and wounding 134 in an escalation of the war to the west of the country as intense fighting was reported elsewhere. A Russian airstrike hit a large military base in western Ukraine on Sunday, extending the conflict into new areas. At least 35 people died and more than 130 were wounded, according to regional governor Maxim Kozitsky. He said Russian planes fired around 30 rockets at the facility, but some were intercepted. Britain said the incident at the extensive Yavoriv base, just 15 miles from the border with NATO member Poland, marked a significant escalation. It also heightens fears that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could spill over into neighboring NATO member states. US President Joe Biden has previously said NATO would defend every inch of its territory if that happened. Intensive Russian attacks have been reported around the country. In Cherniv, around 100 miles northeast of Kyiv, firefighters rescued residents from a burning building after heavy shelling verified video from Ukraine's emergency services showed. Moscow denies targeting civilians. Ukraine also reported renewed airstrikes on an airport in the west and attacks on the southern town of Mykolaiv, where officials said nine people were killed. Ukraine's human rights monitor said Russia used phosphorus bombs in an overnight attack on the town of Popasna in the eastern Luhansk region. In the southern port city of Kherson, more than 400 people were detained by Russia's National Guard as they protested against Russia's occupation of the area. Break the 
according to Ukraine's military high command. Despite the violence, both Russia and Ukraine said they thought progress could be made at peace talks. 18 days after Moscow launched what it calls a special military operation. A Ukrainian delegate said Russia was beginning to, quote, talk constructively, and results were possible in a matter of days. A Russian delegate also said they'd made significant progress. Russia strikes Kyiv, lets its talks resume. The fourth round of talks between Ukraine and Russia have begun. To get more details on this, let's cross over to Abdul World News Special Correspondent Marsha Patiraja, who joins us now from Kursk in Russia. Marsha, over to you. Ishir Ali. At least one person was killed and three injured when a shell hit a residential building on Kiev on. According to the Ukrainian Interior Ministry advisor Anton Gerashenko, two people were killed and three were hospitalized. The building was set ablaze and wounded residents were seen being evacuated. Ukraine reported renewed airstrikes on an airport in the west, heavy shelling on Cherniv, northeast of the capital, and att attacks on the southern town of Mykolaiv, where officials said nine people were killed. Kiev authorities said they were stockpiling two weeks' worth of essential food items for the two million people who have not yet fled to the capital. More, moreover, social network app Instagram is now blocked in Russia, following similar bans on Facebook and Twitter. This was confirmed by the NetBlock cybersecurity watchdog and Russian Instagram users earlier today. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Marsha Patiraja, reporting from Kursk in Russia. More than 1.6 million Ukrainian refugees have fled to Poland, overwhelming many cities. Some fear that Poland would be the next target of Russia. Some 2.5 million people have fled Ukraine since Russia invaded two weeks ago, and around 2 million more have been internally displaced by the census wall. With Russian forces pushing on with their offensive, the flow of people leaving Ukraine continues unabated. Some refugees arriving at a train station just across the border in Poland spoke of the horror. Six out of ten Ukrainian refugees are heading to Poland, with the total number so far there now at 1.5 million. The combined total of all refugees to neighboring countries is above the 2.5 million mark. Other states taking Ukrainians in include Romania, Moldova, Hungary and Slovakia. The United Nations is currently basing its relief plans on 4 million people fleeing, but says it may need to revise the number upwards. In Ukraine, the UN estimates that there are now at least 2 million internally displaced people, an additional 12.65 million people directly affected by the conflict. They're also contending with freezing temperatures. Humanitarian agencies are scrambling to provide heating facilities at border crossings. Meanwhile, lorries are taking thousands of thermal blankets and mattresses in the other direction, with hundreds of thousands of people trapped under heavy bombardment of cities and towns, and with both sides blaming the other for failing to observe ceasefire. Over in Pradesh now, demonstrators filed, filled streets and marched to music and drum beats and carried placards, many with the slogan, Look Up, a reference to the Netflix film Don't Look Up, considered to be a satire of climate politics. The march comes as Europe is seeing skyrocketing energy costs partially linked to the war in Ukraine. The EU still pays hundreds of millions of US dollars every day to Russia, its biggest energy supplier, for more than 40% of its natural gas, more than a quarter of oil imports and almost half of its coal. March participants urge people to lessen their consumption of fossil fuels, which they say finance the Russian invasion, which the country calls a special operation. Energy pollutes, of course, and the nation have to lessen the consumption instead. Gas price has to rise and much more people realize that they have to use their cars less. Left-wing presidential candidates in France's April vote also participated in the climate march. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. A court challenge brought against the U.S. government's practice of retaining migrant children at the border was shut down by President Biden despite the controversy surrounding the order, which allowed for faster expulsion of migrant families.
The Biden administration said unaccompanied migrant children will continue to not be expelled from the United States in a bid to counter a court challenge to the current practice. The controversial Title 42 order was issued by the CDC in March 2020 when Donald Trump was president at the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic. It allowed U.S. authorities to quickly expel migrant families caught crossing the U.S. border without a chance to seek refuge in the U.S. Biden reversed some of Trump's hardline immigration policies after taking office in January 2021, but government data shows his administration has expelled migrants more than a million times under the Title 42 order. Early in his presidency, Biden exempted unaccompanied children from the expulsion policy. But a federal judge in Texas ruled on March 4th that Biden could no longer grant such an exemption. On Saturday, in a 21-page order justifying the decision to end Title 42 for unaccompanied children, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky cited a decrease in COVID-19 cases and increased vaccination rates in both the United States and in Central America. South Korean President-elect Yoon is speeding up the formation of his transition team, heading today for the first time to a new office set up for him in central Seoul. He appointed some key figures to his team who lead special committees on national unity and regional growth. South Korean President-elect Yoon sung yeol for the first time headed to his office set up in Tongidong in downtown Seoul, just down the road from the Blue House. In a meeting with the leaders of his transition committee, Yoon called for the committee to ramp up his speed, stressing that his core theme will be unifying people. Yoon, during the meeting, named those who will be leading special committees on the very agenda. Kim Han Gil is named as the head of the Special Committee on National Unity. Kim had briefly been part of Yoon's election campaign, recruiting personnel with centrist or non conservative views. Kim Byung Jun will head the Committee on Balanced National Growth. Kim, during the Noh Muhyan administration, had played a key role in planning making the central city of Sejong the administrative capital in an effort to balance out developments focused on Seoul. Their appointments come after Yoon named An Chur Su his candidacy merger partner as the chair, Kwon Young se as the vice chair, and Won Yu Young as the planning chief. During their first joint meeting, they vowed to do their best to make a successful administration. In a closed-door session, Yoon reportedly reiterated his vision to seam down the Blue House, getting rid of the Office of Senior Secretary for Civil Affairs, often accused of secret probe. The Yoon administration could fill their role by reviving the Blue House Special Inspection Bureau and internal anti-corruption body. The president-elect has always been consistent on the idea that everyone is equal before the law. Reviving the anti-corruption body is to be discussed by the transition committee. Later in the afternoon, Yoon visited the nearby Namdaemun traditional market. He advised small business owners hit by the pandemic will get the compensation he promised them during his election campaign, stressing the importance of the middle class in economic growth. South Korea's daily infection tally remains in the 300,000 and starting today, rapid antigen tests have the same validity as PCR tests. Also starting the end of this month, young children will be able to get vaccinated. South Korea reported another 309,790 new COVID-19 cases on Monday. Quite a dip from the highest tally ever recorded on Saturday, but three days in a row above 300,000. Nonetheless, 1,158 patients are currently in severely ill condition, an all-time high, and with 200 more lives lost, the death toll stands at 10,595. Nearly 67 percent of intensive care beds are occupied. Health authorities predict the Omicron surge will reach its peak sometime before March 22nd, possibly this week. From Monday, to free up resources, results from rapid antigen tests conducted by medical professionals will have the same validity as PCR tests in confirming COVID-19 infections. The decision comes as data shows almost 95 percent of people who tested positive through a rapid antigen test also tested positive with a PCR test. The change will allow those over 60 to be prescribed with the oral COVID-19 treatment Paxlovid, following a positive rapid antigen test. On the vaccination front, 
Korea will start inoculating children aged 5 to 11 at around 1,200 designated medical institutions nationwide on the 31st of this month. Reservations begin in just 10 days on the 24th. Health officials say they're going to start with minors at high risk, such as those with weak immune systems. Amid a rise in positive tests among children, the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety last month approved the use of Pfizer's vaccine for the age group at a dosage level that's one-third the amount given to adults. For kids between the age of 12 and 17, booster shots begin Monday. Meanwhile, students and teachers who live with someone who has COVID-19 can still attend school in person starting Monday. Instead of entering self-isolation, they're advised to receive PCR tests within three days of their family member testing positive before taking a rapid antigen test on the sixth or seventh day. Not just in South Korea, but China is also facing a rise in cases now turning to the spread of the virus outside Korean borders. A number of countries, including China and Germany, are witnessing another surge of COVID-19 infections. This has prompted Chinese cities like Shenzhen to put their citizens under a strict city-wide lockdown. China has decided to put its southern tech hub Shenzhen under a city-wide lockdown following a latest spike in new COVID-19 cases. Residents in the city of some 17.5 million people will have to undergo three rounds of COVID-19 testing. All businesses except those that supply food, fuel and other necessities were ordered to close or adopt a work-from-home scheme. The decision comes as Chinese health authorities confirmed a total of 66 new COVID-19 infections in Shenzhen City on Sunday. While the number of new cases detected in mainland China is relatively low compared to Hong Kong or other countries, authorities are enforcing a, quote, zero-tolerance strategy and have locked down entire cities and isolated people who have been infected. Over in Europe, Germany is grappling with a significant rise in daily COVID-19 infections. As of Sunday, the country reported over 1,500 new infections per 100,000 people, a jump from some 1,200 a week earlier. Despite the surge, the country is set to drop most of its COVID-19 restrictions from March 20th. Spain, which was the global epicentre of Omicron, is gradually transitioning to a new normality. Large-scale in-person events that had been either postponed or cancelled have reopened. This comes as the country's new case numbers dropped significantly as of February. The occupancy rate of intensive care COVID-19 beds has also declined to the 10% range. Nevertheless, Spanish health authorities warned that people should still take precautions. At a time when the COVID-19 mutant largely known as Stealth Omicron is spreading, they are requiring people wear face masks in indoor settings. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korea's tech exports last month hit a record high. Display panels and computers led the way with exports of chips topping $10 billion for a tenth month in a row. Several stars subtly expressed support for Ukraine by wearing pins and ribbons in the colors of its national flag on the BAFTA's red carpet as the award seasons bring back the glitz and glamour in person following virtual events due to the pandemic last year. Wildfires in South Korea's eastern coastal areas have been active for the longest time since 1986. The wildfires in Eugene have spread to Samshok in Gangwon-do province and have been active for more than a week or some 192 hours of this morning. Troops, firefighters and helicopters are still struggling to contain the fire. Ukrainian police say that an American journalist working in Ukraine has been shot dead in the town of Irpin, just outside the country's capital city. The police claim Brent Renaud, a journalist and filmmaker, was targeted by Russian soldiers. Tesla chief executive officer Elon Musk said the United States electric car maker and his rocket company SpaceX are facing significant informationary pressure in raw material and logistics. Legendary Super Bowl quarterback Tom Brady is back and he is here to stay, it seems, as he has abruptly ended his retirement from the sport to play to Tampa starting next season. Just six weeks after announcing retirement, NFL great Tom Brady said he was reversing that decision. The seven-time Super Bowl winning quarterback said on Sunday he's headed back to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for a 23rd season. Brady is considered one of the greatest players in National Football League history. Though his decision to retire at the start of February was not unexpected, his about-face has left the sporting world stunned. 
On Twitter, Brady said, quote, I've realized my place is still on the field and not in the stands, bringing a quick end to the Buccaneers' search for a starting quarterback. Brady spent 20 seasons with the New England Patriots, winning six Super Bowls before moving to Tampa Bay, where he led the Bucs to championship in his first season with them. The 44-year-old's decision to retire also came after one of the best seasons of his long career. While it is unclear what inspired Brady to make a comeback, the NFL legend was spotted at a Premier League match on Saturday, where Cristiano Ronaldo led Manchester United to victory with an impressive hat-trick, beating Tottenham Hotspur at Old Trafford. In that same match, Ronaldo laid claim to becoming professional football's all-time leading scorer. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we air tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with the closing ceremony of the Winter Paralympics that carried the message of love after games that began with political chaos. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.